Iceland, a land of beaches and lava fields, midnight sun and endless night, fire and ice. Join me as we explore one of the most beautiful and rugged countries on the face of the planet and dig a little deeper into the cultural and natural quirks that make this place so unique. Hopped the red eye flight to Keflavik, Iceland's main international airport, and arrived, sleepless and groggy, at 6.15 in the morning. At the airport, we picked up our rental car. This is the best way to get around in Iceland, especially in more remote regions where options like transit are really not available. Our first stop after leaving the airport was the Blue Lagoon. One of the most popular tourist destinations in Iceland, this is a massive geothermal pool with cloudy blue waters featuring all manner of amenities from an in-pool bar to complimentary mud masks. Imagine a hot tub, but an order of magnitude larger than any swimming pool you've ever seen. Despite feeling a bit like an expensive tourist trap, spending time relaxing here after the long, sleepless flight was an amazing way to unwind. This lagoon is made possible by one of Iceland's key resources, geothermal energy. Being situated on the fault between the European and North American tectonic plates, Iceland is a highly volcanic region, and as a result has a nearly unlimited supply of hot geothermal water, which people here use for everything from generating electricity to filling pools like this one. From the Blue Lagoon, we made the short drive to our next destination, the Fagradosfjall Active Volcanic Area. Here, we could see still hot lava rocks from recent eruptions, though unfortunately we missed seeing any actual magma coming out of the ground. It was quite a hike, especially after our flight, but well worth it to see firsthand the mechanism that has shaped this entire country. Finally exhausted, we headed toward the coast and our hotel. Upon arriving, it was surprising to find the door unlocked and key inside, something we saw consistently over the course of the trip. This is because Iceland is the safest and most peaceful country in the world, and as a result, people here tend to be quite trusting. Anyway, with that, we went to bed early and slept like rocks. The next morning, after sleeping off the jet lag, we got on Route 1, Iceland's famous ring road, and headed north from the capital region. Our first stop for the day was the town of Borkanes, a cute little hamlet located about an hour north of Reykjavik. The town has a pretty harbor and waterfront area, along with a few interesting sculptures, but in particular, it's home to the Icelandic Settlement Exhibition. Unfortunately, photography is not allowed inside, so I can't show you what it looks like, but this is a really interesting audio-guided museum that tells of the early days of Iceland's settlement. It reveals how Iceland used to be a temperate rainforest before its settlement, and explains how this is one of the few countries in the world which had no indigenous peoples. The Viking and Celtic settlers are believed to be the first people ever to have lived here. Next, we began a day's journey off the main ring road into the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, a region in the west of Iceland known for its mountains, waterfalls, and rock formations. Here, we saw sites like the Göteborg Basalt Cliffs, which were ruggedly beautiful and surrounded by an almost desert-like landscape. We then stopped in the cute fishing village of Sticky Solmer and took a look at its iconic lighthouse and church. Finally, we visited the famous Kirkjufell. Claimed by some to be the most photographed mountain in Iceland, it's a tall, sloping peak standing behind a waterfall, which makes for quite the striking image. We stayed the night in Olafsvik, another town on the peninsula with some beautiful views. I loved the down-to-earth fishing village vibe here, as it felt like a whole different world from the cities I'm used to. Once there, we caught a phenomenal sunset over the ocean and went to sleep. 
The next day, we woke bright and early and began the seven-hour drive to the West Fjords region of Iceland. The West Fjords are considered Iceland's best-kept secret. Located hundreds of kilometers off the ring road, this is one of the least touristed parts of the country, but no less beautiful than the rest. The West Fjords are one of the few remaining areas of Iceland where you can drive for hours and not see a single other person. It felt like we were the only ones in the world. Still, the roads here are not for the faint of heart. Mostly one-lane gravel tracks snaking up the sides of steep mountains before plunging seaward, they're some of the most beautiful roads I've ever been on, but more than a little scary. As you might imagine, there aren't a lot of big roads here for GPS to follow, so navigation is pretty hit or miss. We got quite lost wandering from farmhouse to farmhouse trying to find our cabin, but eventually, late in the afternoon, we made it. We stayed in the village of Hagi, if you could call it that. It was pretty much two farms and a church, set against a backdrop of a fjord on one side and rugged mountains on all others. My idea of heaven. Anyway, shortly after arriving, we had to get right back in the car and drive another hour to buy groceries from one of the few established towns in the region. After all of that, we were pretty exhausted. We made dinner, went outside for some stunning stargazing, and went to bed. The next morning, we woke up to a beautiful, sunny day, packed with scenic drives and jaw-dropping scenery in the West Fjords. First up, we made the long and quite harrowing drive through the fjords to La Trebjarg. This is a series of massive cliffs rising hundreds of feet from the ocean. Considered by some to be the westernmost point in Europe, these treacherous cliffs are also home to one of the world's largest puffin colonies. Unfortunately, by the time we got there in late August, the puffins had already migrated south for the winter. Still, the sheer scale and drama of the landscape was well worth the visit. The combination of the rugged cliffs, blowing winds, and thick mist made for an ominously beautiful sight. I'm not afraid of heights, but walking mere feet from a 1,500-foot drop, with gusts of wind blowing toward the edge at unpredictable intervals, sure kept my confidence in check. It's a place where nature is firmly in charge. After a long, somewhat terrifying hike along the unstable cliff edge, we made our way back to the car and drove on toward Raudesandur, the red sand beach. When we arrived, I could hardly believe only an hour had passed. Gone were the mist and winds, along with the jagged landscape. In their stead, a blue sky, tiny town, and reddish sands made for an utterly serene landscape. After a while here, we piled back in the car and continued along the fjords. Along the way, we stopped to look at an abandoned DC-3, which felt like a time capsule, especially from the inside, as I walked through the very same cabin and stood in the same cockpit that would have once been filled with World War II aviators. Next, a little farther along the coast road, we stopped to look at an old grounded fishing boat that has slowly been rusting away on a scenic beach. While driving through these regions, I first noticed an interesting trend of Icelanders. Everywhere, in fields and on the sides of the road, lay not just planes and shipwrecks, but dozens of decaying excavators, cars, tractors, and all manner of other equipment. It seems as if Icelanders take these things out to start projects, get bored, and then just sort of leave them to rust. I'd love to learn the actual reason for this, since to an outsider like me, it seems like quite an odd behavior. Anyway, the last stop for the day was Dinyandi, the biggest waterfall in the West Fjords region. Shaped kind of like a jewel, this towering waterfall is surrounded by several smaller waterfalls cascading toward the sea below. It makes for a stunning landscape, especially in the golden hour, and I enjoyed climbing around near the falls and soaking up the scenery. Finally, with the sun going down, we headed back toward the cabin for some rest and relaxation. The next day, we checked out of our cabin in Hagi and began the long journey out of the West Fjords. We spent most of the day driving along the rugged coastlines of the West Fjords and explored one of Iceland's famous F-roads along the way. 
These are ungraded gravel roads that traverse the most sparsely populated regions of the country, often requiring you to drive through rivers and other rough terrain. Four-wheel drive is required on these roads, and insurance typically doesn't cover driving here, but I'd argue it's worthwhile for the unspoiled views and complete isolation of these paths less traveled. Driving through the sparse highland landscape, along the rocky track with no one else in sight, it felt like we were explorers discovering a new land. After driving the length of the F road, we continued along a coastal road through a number of picturesque fjords for several more hours before eventually exiting the West Fjords, getting back on Iceland's ring road, and entering the next stage of our trip, Northwest Iceland. We stopped for our first night in the north in the town of Blundos. Blundos is a charming little town with its fair share of attractions including an iconic church inspired by a volcanic crater and a massive river flowing out into the ocean. After exploring the town for a while, we headed to our cabin for a soak in the sulfur-smelling hot tub and a good night's sleep. The next morning, we hit the road for a short drive toward the town of Akureyri. Along the way, we stopped by the Glaumbeyer Farm and Museum. This is a series of preserved turf houses that up until 1947 were a homestead for an Icelandic family working in the wool business. Now they're a beautiful spot to stop and take photos, and a time capsule back to an earlier way of life in Iceland. It's amazing to see how less than a century ago these people lived such completely different lives, so far removed from civilization. From Glaumbeyer, we got back on the road and drove on toward one of the oldest turf churches in Iceland. Many old buildings in Iceland were constructed with turf, as it was easily sourced and served as a more efficient insulator against harsh winters than other available materials. Back on the road, our next stop was the town of Akureyri. Akureyri is the second largest city in Iceland, and unofficially considered the capital of the north. It's a charming town located at the end of one of Iceland's longest fjords. It exists in a slightly warmer microclimate than surrounding areas, which allows it to have the world's northernmost botanical gardens, a surprising sight to see in the North Atlantic. Akureyri is home to a number of cute, colorful streets with strong Scandinavian vibes. I loved that despite its larger size, it still felt like a lot of the other small towns and villages around Iceland. And of course, what kind of Icelandic town would it be without an iconic church inspired by local geology? Also, fun fact, Every red traffic light in the city is shaped like a heart. Anyway, after a bit more city exploring by foot, we hit the hay for the night. The next morning, we got back on the ring road and headed out of Akureyri. The road east from Akureyri is particularly interesting because you drive into a massive tunnel on the outskirts of town, and the tunnel is so long that by the time you get out of it, you're in the middle of the beautiful, empty countryside. Leaving Akureyri marked the next phase of our journey, our entrance into the particularly volcanic northeast region of Iceland. Our first stop for the day, right off the ring road, was Godafoss, or the Waterfall of the Gods. It's not the biggest or most powerful waterfall in Iceland, but I like it for its beautiful horseshoe shape and storied history. It was here that Thorgir Thorkelsen, sorry for that pronunciation, famously threw his priceless idols of the pagan gods over the falls in the year 1000. This was a symbol of the country's conversion to Christianity, and gave the falls their name. From Godafoss, we drove onward to the Mivaten area, named for nearby Lake Mivaten. This is one of my favorite regions of Iceland for its multitude of diverse activities and sights to see. First, we went to see the Griotka Lava Caves. Once featured in the Game of Thrones, these beautiful, volcanically formed caves have sharply textured rock walls and are partially filled with blue waters. It's an otherworldly sight after clambering into a tiny hole in the ground to see this. I felt like I was living in a stock photo. Outside the caves, we walked around a bit where you can see massive cracks in the ground formed by seismic activity in the area. It's slightly disconcerting, but also awe-inspiring to see the extent that this landscape has been both created and ravaged by volcanic and seismic activity. 
After another short drive, we arrived at the Ferrier geothermal area. This is an expansive region of brown mud and bubbling, smoking ground. One interesting thing here is these rock cones, which spout constant streams of very strong smelling steam. I call them eggy volcanoes, because they look a little bit like tiny volcanoes, and the closest thing I could compare their smell to would be about a million hard-boiled eggs, all expired and slowly rotting. I kid you not, it smells very bad. But beyond these, the very ground in this area steams, and the groundwater boils. That's how active this region gets. It makes for quite a spectacle, and I would have stood around longer if it wasn't for the unbelievable stench. Next, as raindrops began to fall from the sky, we embarked on a hike across a nearby ridgeline. The wetter it got, the more unstable the slope became, until we were slipping and sliding along the steep slopes with huge clumps of mud clinging to our boots. Add to that a biting cold wind, and it wasn't the most pleasant of conditions. Still, the Martian-esque landscape and incredible views kept us going. Finally, after the hike, we headed to the Mivatan nature baths to relax and unwind for the evening. These are similar to the Blue Lagoon, but much smaller and with a better view. I also think the smell is a little stronger, and the water felt strangely slimy, which is a bit of a disconcerting feeling. Overall though, it's a beautiful place to relax and soak up the scenery. And after a little while at the nature baths, we made our way back to our hotel and went to bed. The next day, with considerably better weather, we set out for the south shore of Lake Mivaten. Here, we explored a series of pseudo-craters along the shore. These rare formations are primarily found here and on the surface of Mars, and they're formed by water and steam shooting up from the ground during periods of high volcanic activity. It kind of felt like I was walking on the moon, if the moon was blue and green. Unfortunately, with the better weather came flies. Lots of them. As we walked along the shore of the lake, we were literally swarmed by millions of tiny stinging bugs, so we couldn't spend too long by the water. Fleeing the bugs, we made our next stop a distance away, at the Ferfjall Crater. This is a massive black crater of an old volcano, which you can climb on and walk around. We made the full circle around the top, soaking in the panoramic views and the sheer scale this volcano possesses. Next, we headed to Dimuburgir, or Dark Castle's lava fields. This is a massive park filled with above-ground lava formations from previous eruptions. It's quite a sight to walk among these towering behemoths, especially some which we were allowed to climb through. While beautiful now, these formations serve as another reminder of just how much molten lava flowed everywhere the last time this area had a major eruption. Finally, our last stop for the day was the Krafla Crater. This is another old volcanic crater you can walk around, but it's made of light tan rock, and on the inside, it shelters a gorgeous aquamarine lake. It's also set against a backdrop of stunning red-brown mountains that further accentuate the scene. On the way back to the hotel, we saw this funny shower by the edge of the road. It's connected to a hot spring, so it just runs forever constantly dumping out a stream of warm, stinky water. It's a funny reminder of the state of extreme abundance that swathes Iceland. From near-infinite clean energy to countless sources of water, resource conservation is hardly even a concern here. Anyway, from the mysterious shower, we made our way back to the hotel. Now you might think the day would end there, but no. We had just turned in for the night when we got a wake-up call from the front desk. The northern lights were visible. Normally, you only really see the aurora in the dark Icelandic winter, but with the end of August approaching, the nights were long enough and we were able to see them. Technically, the aurora borealis is a purely scientific phenomenon. Radiation from solar flares hits the Earth's atmosphere, is channeled north by the planet's magnetic field, and then excites the particles in the air, causing them to emit this green-blue color. But seeing these lights, science is the last thing on the mind. It's a stunning, otherworldly experience, and I never wanted to go to bed. The next day, we headed away from Mivaten toward Detifos. Down another deserted road, we find this waterfall, which, by volume, is the largest in Europe. It's not a particularly pretty waterfall, in my opinion, 
with a massive, uncoordinated rush of very dirty water, but there's no denying the impressiveness of its sheer enormity. This area also features several pretty ponds and walking paths, as well as another waterfall called Selfos. In addition, a short drive down a bumpy gravel road from the two waterfalls is another waterfall, set in a beautiful, massive canyon reminiscent of the Grand Canyon. It's an awesome, underrated site, and I'm glad we even noticed it was there. Anyway, after spending some time at the canyon, we made our way back onto the ring road and passed a number of smaller landmarks as we went. One of these was a large suspension bridge known as the Golden Gates of the North. It's quite an architectural site, and particularly surprising to see amongst the natural emptiness of the surrounding area. We also stopped by another turf church. This time, we were able to go inside, making it feel like even more of a time capsule to an older way of living in Iceland. We also got to get up close with some sheep along the way. Sheep are the most common livestock in Iceland, and in the summers, they're often given free reign to wander across the country wherever they please. As a result, everywhere we went, from glaciers to volcanoes, we often saw sheep around. Then, in September, shortly after when our trip ended, thousands of farmers come out on horses and ATVs and herd their sheep back for the winter so they don't drown in the snow. From here, we got off the ring road and entered the next region of Iceland, the East Fjords. While not as remote as the West Fjords, the East Fjords are still beautiful, with dozens of cute little fishing villages nestled on calm, sculpted fjords. We stayed the night in Seydisfjordr, which I thought was probably the prettiest town on the trip. The combination of towering mountains, a scenic fjord, and the colorful houses and buildings make it an irresistibly cozy spot. The town is also surrounded by a number of small waterfalls, and its harbor is framed by a picturesque shipwreck on one end and a small industrial dock on the other. Unfortunately, this town's history is not all happy. Once one of the most historically accurate fishing villages in Iceland, the entire town was nearly wiped out by a series of devastating landslides in 2020. Museums were destroyed, houses and businesses were swept into the sea, and the entire area had to be evacuated. Luckily, no one was killed or seriously injured, but this just serves as another reminder that nature is firmly in charge in this land of fire and ice. Anyway, after exploring the town, we went to bed. The next morning, we got on the scenic road out of Seydisfjordr and began our journey further south through the fjords. Along the way, we stopped to hike near another waterfall, Hengifoss. The trail winds through grassy hills and stops by a smaller waterfall on the way to the main attraction. This one is still ruggedly beautiful, framed by basalt columns and sharp drop-offs on all sides. Further up, the trail continues to wind through scenic hills on the way to Hengifoss. The waterfall itself is tall, slender, and stunning. But again, on the last stretches of the trail, you can see evidence of massive rockfalls that nearly took out the path. Yet another reminder of who's in charge here. After a beautiful picnic lunch by the falls, we hit the road again on our way to the next region of Iceland, the south. This is one of the more touristed parts of the country, but for good reason. It's home to massive glaciers, beautiful waterfalls, and stunning coastlines. After a few hours drive, we checked into our guesthouse for the night with a view of a massive glacier right from the window. We woke up early the next morning to head to Jokulsarlon, a massive glacier lagoon touching one branch of the Vatna Jokul ice cap, the largest glacier in Europe. It was my first time seeing icebergs in person, and I felt like I had stepped into the cover of a National Geographic magazine. After exploring the coastline, we hopped aboard a Zodiac and wound through the maze of icebergs in the lagoon. I know I must sound like a broken record saying this, but it felt like we were on a different planet, unable to see the shore, other people, or any evidence of human civilization, just water and ice as far as the eye could see. Leaving the iceberg maze, we zoomed across the 8-kilometer lagoon toward the edge of the glacier itself. We stopped along the way to look at a few more icebergs and a harbor seal who posed for a pic. 
We sat and watched for a while as icebergs calved off and dramatically splashed into the lagoon. It's an amazing sight to see, but also a saddening one, as our guide explained to us the rate at which this glacier is melting, and that, at the current pace of climate change, it will simply cease to exist within a few decades. It saddens me to think that this is a sort of beauty which will likely not exist for the next generation if we don't do something about our climate. After the Zodiac tour, we headed to the nearby Diamond Beach. This is a black sand beach adjacent to the mouth of the lagoon. Due to its placement, smaller ice chunks from the lagoon wash up onto this beach and make it look kind of like a field of diamonds, all reflecting the sky and contrasting against the black of the sand. It's a beautiful sight, but one that's difficult to take in due to the sheer number of tourists here. Especially in this easily accessible region of Iceland, popular destinations are often completely overrun by tourists. I was shocked to learn that although Iceland has a population of less than 400,000 people, most years it hosts over 2 million foreign tourists. This is one of Iceland's main streams of income, and it almost single-handedly pulled the country out of the 2008 financial crisis, but it's also slowly spoiling some of the country's natural beauty, and leading to erosion and other forms of degradation in some of the most beautiful places around Iceland. I can't really complain, since as a tourist myself, I'm part of the problem, but it remains a troubling dilemma for this country. Anyway, from the tourist-filled Diamond Beach, we moved on toward our next destination, the turf church known as Hofskirke, in the small village of Hof. This is a particularly cozy-looking church, with the colorful trees planted all around it, a roof which seems to spill over onto the ground, and undulating burial mounds that in my mind make the lawn outside look kind of like ski moguls. Built in 1884, this is actually the last turf church built in the old style in all of Iceland. And unlike many of its contemporaries, this one is actually still a practicing parish. Next, we made our way to the Skaftafell Glacier area. Here we joined up with a qualified guide and went for a hike toward another tongue of the massive Vatnajökull ice cap. Once at the edge of the glacier, we strapped on crampons, put on helmets, and learned how to use ice axes. Then we embarked on a three-hour excursion across the surface of the glacier. We explored the contours of the ice, peered down crevasses, and soaked up some truly outstanding views. This was another National Geographic experience, where I could hardly believe I was really seeing what I was seeing firsthand, rather than in pictures from a magazine. It was great fun, and a true once-in-a-lifetime experience. From here, we packed back into the car and headed to our next guest house, further along the ring road in the southern region. Upon arriving, exhausted, we went to bed. The next morning, as sometimes happens in Iceland, we woke up to blowing winds and a vicious rainstorm. Still, we hopped in the car and pressed on. Our first stop was the Fjadargjufur Canyons. Apologies again for my horrible pronunciation. This is a series of lush green cliffs fading into the distance, filled with waterfalls and shrouded in a mystical fog. It was a beautiful spot to see. And, fun fact, Justin Bieber once recorded a music video here. Still, it was hard to fully soak up the scenery here as the rain was busily soaking through my waterproof clothing. So, we hopped in the car and made our way toward the day's next sight. Once inside the car, I realized I had actually pretty badly waterlogged one of my cameras from the weather, despite keeping it in a waterproof bag the entire time we were out in the canyons. Another demonstration of the power of the natural elements in Iceland. Anyway, our next destination, in the gusting wind and pouring rain, and recorded on my phone, was Reynisfjara. This is one of Iceland's most famous black sand beaches, and was quite packed with tourists despite the weather. The area is famous for its jet black sands, towering basalt formations, and rocky outcroppings reaching out into the ocean. It was definitely an impressive sight to see, and amazing to think that even this landscape was crafted by volcanic activity. Next up, peering through a very foggy car windshield, we made our way to Dirhole, one of the southernmost points in Iceland. 
Here, among other things, you can see expansive beaches stretching out into the distance, a lighthouse standing strong against the elements, and rock arches straight out of a computer wallpaper. Apparently there are also puffins here earlier in the season. It was a beautiful spot. I only wish it was a little clearer so we could have seen more of the view. Our next stop for the day was the mighty Salyansfoss, a tall, narrow waterfall that crashes down into a beautiful green bowl. One of the cooler features of this waterfall is a walking path behind the falls themselves. It's a pretty different perspective to be able to get so close to the sheer power of the falls, but man is it wet. I'm glad we went here on this miserable rainy day, since I was already pretty soaked beforehand, so it didn't make too much difference for me. Finally, for the last stop of the day, we made our way towards Skogofoss, one of the most powerful waterfalls on the south coast of Iceland. Like Detifoss, this waterfall shoots out a large volume of rather muddy brown water, but its sheer scale is stunning nonetheless. It was here, though, that we began to notice the effects of the long, rainy day. The parking lot looked like a flooded wasteland, with massive craters full of water everywhere you looked, and the waterfall was kicking out way more volume than usual, sending the river at the bottom over its banks and nearly all the way into the parking lot. It was a stunning show of scale, and a reminder of just how quickly things can change in this dynamic landscape. After a while in the Skogofoss area, we were thoroughly soaked, and decided to head for our cabin and turn in for the night. The next morning, we awoke to thankfully better weather and made our way toward the town of Hela. Here, we visited a massive horse farm where they breed and keep over a hundred horses at any given time. These are Icelandic horses, which are a particular coveted breed of horse. In Iceland, they're so concerned about the pedigree of Icelandic horses that they will never allow any horse to be brought into the country, even if it's an Icelandic horse that was originally born here. After looking around for a bit, we got the chance to saddle up and ride some Icelandic horses through the surrounding fields and countryside. The weather had luckily cleared up, and the scenery made it feel like we were riding through a screensaver, as we made our way along narrow dirt paths through massive fields. Partway through, we got to try out the Icelandic horses Tult. This is a unique gait which only Icelandic horses possess, somewhere between a walk and a trot. It enables the horses to go much faster than walking, while still maintaining stability, a feature they developed to be able to traverse the uneven ground of the Icelandic countryside. Horse ride over, we headed to another attraction in Hela, the Hela Caves. These are a few of the hundreds of caves hidden underground in this area, which have been open to public access. They're fascinating human-made caves hidden just under the ground, which over the years have been used for everything from barns to storage rooms. Particularly interesting, though, is that these caves are believed to have been made before Viking times, and actually seem to be of a more Celtic style. This indicates the potential that contrary to the typically told Icelandic history, the Vikings may not have actually been the very first people to discover and settle Iceland, and the Celtics may have actually arrived almost a hundred years earlier. From here, we moved on to the next stage of our trip, the Golden Circle. The Golden Circle is a circular route near the capital region which contains a number of scenic and historical attractions. Due to its proximity to Reykjavik and the airport, it's often frequented by travelers on short stopovers in Iceland. As a result, it tends to be a very busy area, but it's still quite beautiful. Our first stop on the Golden Circle and last destination for the day was the Kerith Crater. This is an ancient volcanic crater with a deep red color, sheltering a dark turquoise crater lake. It's a beautiful spot, but with all the people around, it's a little less tranquil than I would have liked. After spending a while at the Kerith Crater and getting caught in some heavy rain again, we decided to head to our next cabin. Once there, we enjoyed the hot tub for a while, and went to bed. The next morning, we awoke to better weather, and continued along the Golden Circle. Our first stop for the day was the Gezir Geothermal Area. As you may have guessed from its name, this area is the namesake for the word geyser. 
Although the massive geyser is currently dormant and little more than a pool of hot water, its little sibling Strokur is very much alive and well, sending plumes of hot spray into the air every few minutes. Geysers are quite a rare sight to see, and this is a particularly striking one, outlined against the rugged Icelandic landscape. Next up, we made our way to Gulfos, the Golden Waterfall. The namesake of the Golden Circle, Gulfos is one of the larger waterfalls in Iceland. Its sheer volume, combined with the stunning canyons it's carved out over the years, make it one of the most stunning waterfalls in the country. After Gulfos, we headed to Thingvellir, which has got to be one of the most multifaceted places in Iceland. Naturally, it's beautiful, with waterfalls, towering rock formations, blue reflecting ponds, and even a church. But beyond all that, it's actually situated precisely on one of the faults between the North American and European tectonic plates, and in one place you can walk along the fault between the two continents. It's amazing walking through what appears to be just another canyon, to think that you're right in between these massive continental plates. Thought that was all? Nope. Thingvitlir was also home to the Icelandic Althing, a regular meeting of chieftains from all around the country originally founded in 930 CE. This is now thought to be the world's first ever democratic government, laying the groundwork for the parliamentary style governments we now see all around the world. After visiting Thingvitlir, we made our way out of the Golden Circle and back toward Reykjavik, the capital city of Iceland. And when I say city, I mean city. This is one of the few densely populated areas of the country, and is home to almost half of Iceland's entire population. It's an adorable Scandinavian-style city that manages its size gracefully and has a strong sense of community. The colorful buildings and walking-friendly streets make this a fun spot to hang out, although it's certainly quite a culture shock after the desolate wilderness of the rest of the country. Even though it's far from a bustling metropolis, seeing so many people and buildings in one place after the small towns and villages of the rest of Iceland was certainly an adjustment. After grabbing dinner at a cute restaurant off one of Reykjavik's many walking streets, we headed toward the harbor to see some of the city's most iconic landmarks in the golden hour. First up, Harpa, Reykjavik's stunning concert and conference center. Perched right on the edge of the harbor and made of tantalizing glass prisms, it's a strikingly gorgeous building. The inside is also tastefully and modernly decorated, and paints a picture of expensive luxury. It's certainly a big difference from the turf churches and cabins I'd grown accustomed to throughout the rest of the country. Next, we stop by the Sun Voyager sculpture farther along the waterfront. An abstract sculpture designed to convey the promise of undiscovered territory, hope, and freedom, its modern minimalism makes for a beautiful contrast against the fjord beyond. It's a beautiful sight to see, though unfortunately it was positively crawling with other tourists when we stopped by, and it was hard to get a clear look without somebody scrambling all over it. As the sun set and darkness fell over the little city, we hopped on some rental scooters and went for a nighttime ride further along the waterfront. I unfortunately don't have any clear footage of this, but I have a few nice pictures. Just as we were about to head home, the sky suddenly filled with the most beautiful aurora borealis I've ever seen. They filled almost the entire sky and actually danced before our eyes. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen and I wished the moment would never end. But eventually it did. After a while, the sky faded and we made our way back to the hotel for the night. The next morning, we went for a walk through Reykjavik's cute downtown area. First, we headed to Hallgrimskirke, the biggest church in Reykjavik, and in fact, all of Iceland. This massive concrete monolith inspired by basalt columns towers over the rest of the city's relatively small buildings, and strikes an imposing image. It felt fitting as our last tourist visit to a church on this trip. In the afternoon, we again rented some e-scooters to explore more of the city. I think these things are great. They're easy to find and make it simple to cover more distance than you could walking without having to get into a car. 
We explored the downtown and harbor areas of the city and enjoyed a warm, relaxing afternoon. Finally, after a few hours of exploring, it was time to climb into our rental car for the last time and make our way back to Keflavik Airport, where we sadly bid adieu to Iceland and boarded the flight home. Thank you for joining me on this journey around Iceland. This is a new type of video for me, and I'm still getting the hang of the format, so please leave a comment below if you have any thoughts or feedback. Also, while I consider myself an Iceland enthusiast, and I have visited the country multiple times, I am by no means an expert or a local. As such, I want to apologize for any and all pronunciation or factual errors I may have made, or for anything I may have misinterpreted along the way. If you do notice anything like this, feel free to correct me in a comment below. All footage in this video was shot by me on a combination of a Sony A7 Mark II, a GoPro Hero 10 Black, and a Samsung Galaxy S21. The intro music is royalty free from Pixabay, and the voiceover is my voice recorded after the fact. Thanks for watching.